Well, I guess you're all wondering why I brought you here today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we can start. It's four o'clock, but we're, we're in the last panel. I don't know if they're, are they going to cut us off at the end or can we just keep going till we'll see the wee hours yeah, of the morning. <laughs> 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 well, thank, thanks everybody for, for joining us for the last, actually last panel of, of uh, the day. And I hope everybody's been having a good, uh, good festival so far. Um, uh, just to, to start out with, I'm Andy Kunka. I'm a professor of English at the University of South Carolina, Sumter, and um, author of a book on autobiographical comics and a recently published book, The Life and Comics of Howard Cruz, Taking Risks in the Service of Truth, which I'm very proud of. And um, But you're not here to see me, so we'll get started talking about the historical biography in, in comics uh, panel. So uh, before we get started with that, um, I'd like to read the um, a few th introductory remarks here. Uh, first, the land acknowledgement. Cartoon Crossroads Columbus acknowledges that the ancient ancestors of the Eastern Woodlands tribes, now referred to as the Adena and Hopewell cultures, inhabited the land we know as Ohio. Their descendants include the living nations of Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, uh, Delaware, and Seneca Cayuga. We honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this place where we gather. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the sponsors of CXC, uh, including the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, and UBS. So let's go ahead and get, uh, get started with our our panel with some brief introductions, and then I'll start out with some questions. So um, Grace Ellis is a New York Times bestselling comic book writer. Her first venture into comics began while she was still in college, creating and writing Lumberjanes, an all-ages series about monster-fighting Girl Scouts. Uh, from there, it was on to Moonstruck, an adventure romance story about a werewolf barista, followed by several works for DC Comics. Grace's newest book, Flung Out of Space, is is a based on a true story graphic novel about suspense writer Patricia Highsmith. Uh, and Grace lives here in Columbus, Ohio. Then Nate Powell is, um, began self-publishing as an Arkansas teenager in 1992. His work includes Save It for Later, the National Book Award winning March trilogy, uh, and its follow-up Run, Come Again, Two Dead, Any Empire, and Swallow Me Whole. Uh, Powell's work has received four Eisner Awards, two Ignatz Awards, the Comic-Con International Inkpot Award, and multiple ALA and YALSA distinctions. He lives in Bloomington, Indiana, and is currently creating his next solo graphic novel, Fall Through, as well as a graphic adaptation of James Lowen's Lies My Teacher Told Me. And then let's see, Scott Chandler is our final guest. A Chandler is the cartoonist of the critically acclaimed graphic novels Bix and Two Generals, wh uh, which was nominated for two Eisner Awards, selected for Best American Comics 2012, and voted by CBC's Canada Reads as one of the 40 best Canadian nonfiction books of all time. His other works, in, uh, his other work includes Northwest, pa Northwest Passage, nominated for Eisner and Harvey Awards, and the Three, Three, Three Thieves series, winner of the Joe Schuster Award for Best Comic for Kids and listed by Yalsa as a great graphic novel for teens. In 2015, he served as writer in residence at the University of Windsor, the first cartoonist to be appointed so by a Canadian university. He lives and works in Stratford, Ontario, Canada, where he is hard at work on his next project, the Squire and Knight series of all ages fantasy adventure graphic novels for first second. So please welcome our guests. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, so um, my, my first question, um, I want to start out with for, for, for both Grace and, and Scott, is that um, one of the things that struck me in kind of thinking about this panel is that um, Patricia Highsmith and Bix Biederbeck are both Pretty problematic character figures uh, historically. They they have um, uh, different degrees, I guess, of dark sides to them, to say the least, uh, and some seriously unlikable qualities, we might say. So, uh, so first, I'm wondering why you chose as uh, these figures as subjects uh, for your work, and then second, 
What sorts of challenges did you face in dealing with those particular aspects of their personalities? So we can start with Grace. Yeah, I was gonna pass it off. <laughs> Sorry, <to you>. okay. <laughs> Dang it, ah, crap. okay. Okay, so Patricia Highsmith is a really, really interesting character. You can, you kind of, uh, let we'll just get it out there. So she is a terrible person in ways that are fun and a terrible person in ways that are not fun. She is like a womanizer. She slept with her agent's girlfriend, for example, which is just like so self-destructive and hilarious. But on the other side, she's also like anti-Semitic in ways that are like deeply problematic is like putting it very lightly. It's really messed up. Um, so the way that we dealt with it in this book was we, we talked about it for a really long time. We had multiple sensitivity readers. We read a lot of books. And we finally got to a place where we were comfortable just kind of charging right at it and just kind of being like, this is the truth of what happened. This is the truth of like what this historically important person was like. And we can't just like, uh, making that her whole, her whole thing in this book would have been inaccurate because she did something really important that was completely unrelated to that. Um, but also you don't wanna sweep it under the rug because like this is a big part of that still, you know? Um, and it would have been dishonest to leave out entirely. So where we landed was we kind of charge right at it, make sure that it is a part of the narrative, but not the entire narrative. So, so how did how did you know your introduction deals with a lot of that that yeah. stuff like straight up too? Um, what what went into the the choice to kind of make sure readers went into the book knowing this stuff in the first place before they even start like, yeah. reading it? Well, the very first thing that you learn when you open the book is that she is dead. Um, so <laughs> you feel free to feel whatever way you want about her because it doesn't matter because she's dead. Um, but I I think what we wanted to make sure was that it didn't seem like we were co-signing this behavior. Mm -hmm by dealing with it so matter-of-factly. Um, it was, honestly, it, it just felt like, there's there's no perfect answer here, mm -hmm. but by just like being very straightforward about it, that felt like as close to the right answer as we could get. Also, yeah. I do want to, sorry, I do want to say that I really loved Bix. As soon as I started <laughs> reading it, I was like, oh my God, this guy like gets it, you know? <laughs> like, because he's also like, He's rough around the edges, to say the least. And yeah, I was like, I yeah, mean, perfect. Your your <laughs> answer is basically my answer is that you know, there's lots of ways in which Bix was just kind of a lovable scamp and other ways in which he's just a, you know, self-destructive maniac. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it can switch back and forth pretty quickly. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he spoilers, he lived a pretty short life, <laughs> um, but it's interesting, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was interesting dealing with, you know, how how much how much is too much? Uh, are we still going to like this character after this scene? Are we still going to like him by the end? Are we going to care about anything that happens to him? It's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting balancing act. It, you know, when I was researching, I went back and forth, you know, between how much I liked him or not. Yeah. Well, yeah. What we we did the same thing. And where we kind of landed was you don't have to like her, but we're trying to get you to understand. That's exactly. Yeah. It. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. I think I think a lot of artists in particular would be able to relate to Bix, um, you know, because, you know, he was a, a, a creative genius and, and also pretty self-destructive. And I think those t things often go hand in hand, too often go hand in hand. Um, it's 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 a line a lot of us walk between you know you know parental approval is part of the picture and uh, you know the the times are part of the picture and you know him him wanting to you know break out of his you know kind of conservative world that he's in is part of the picture and and I think that's all relatable to artist types. Hopefully we don't all go as far as he did <laughs> in terms of you know what he was willing to do and in, in terms of uh, uh, escape from all that. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a balancing act. So was that complexity a part of the appeal for you to do the story of this person anyway? In yeah, the first place? I, I am certainly one of the people who who could relate. Um, the book really started as a formal experiment where, um, you know, those of you who have seen the book or read the book know that, uh, you know, it plays a lot with page layout in terms of, um, you know, visualizing music, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that were that were 
you know, playing or hearing or experiencing, um, but also using that as a way of reflecting what's going on in Bix's life in terms of like the rhythm of life and, and, uh, and, and all of that. I kind of had that part that I wanted to do before I decided it was going to be Bix. Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be a book about a musician. Uh, and I eventually found a musician that I was interested in who, who fit, but, um, yeah, the origins of the project were really formal and not biographical. Um, since you've already picked up form, this was going to be a later question sure. for me, but uh, <laughs> I want to ask you about the, the choice was, was also that choice to do it about a musician, even before you had picked Bix to do it almost completely, um, silent. Yes. Yeah. That was part of the. That was part of the pitch. That was part of the the challenge. So so what? So I'm, I'm showing up here one sure. of the non-silent passages, which yeah. are the only really section of this narrative that's non that's not silent, which is when um, Bix and it, it's his, his girlfriend at the time are are dealing with this um, this pregnancy situation. Yeah. So what what uh, can you talk about? Why why is that the only? Pass part of the book with dialogue. I didn't want the book to be silent just as a, like a gimmick, like uh -huh. look what I can do with visual storytelling. Um, I really wanted the silences to be purposeful. Mm -hmm. and, and I found for the silences to be purposeful, there had to be some kind of text that I could then take away. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there are maybe two dozen lines of dialogue in chapter two of Bix. Um, you know, he, he's a character who can only express himself musically. Uh, but then he meets this young woman with whom he can actually communicate. Um, but then that relationship, spoilers, goes sour. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, that text disappears. And, uh, and and hopefully people feel it when it's gone. Yeah. Like I say, the, the silence is meaningless unless it's played against something. So, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a... There's a short bit of dialogue, just 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 so I can snatch it away again. <laughs> is, is that a, is that also tied like a musical choice to move from like language to silence and in, in a um, or you know sound to silence and in, 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 in this way? Yeah, music really um, informs. Like not even in this book, but I've always thought about my work very musically, which is why I eventually you know this deep into my career wanted to do a book about music. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all musical. The panels are musical. The, the, the dialogue is musical. Like you say, like the silences are, are part of that. Like certainly that's a part of jazz and, and mm -hmm. music in general. Uh, so yeah, it all, it all works as part of a, a theme and a, and a, you know, formal experiment. Okay. So, and, and when we're, we're thinking about the, uh, my initial question about, you're dealing with uh, characters like Patricia Highsmith and Bix. On the other end of the human spectrum is John <laughs> Lewis. <I think. laughs> so yeah. what? Um, so uh, what? Uh, who's you know widely loved figure whose life serves as a model for peaceful nonviolent protest and dedicated public service. So in in thinking about like in contrast with these other characters we're talking or the other figures we're talking about were there challenges or obligations that you experienced from that end of how you represent somebody that ever that you know just about everybody loves well uh <laughs> I, I would actually step back a decade or step back 15 years yeah. to recognize that uh like when when march started like before i was even on board uh -huh. like when when andrew and congressman lewis uh were were getting to work to make this happen. One of the reasons why the original concept came up was that like Andrew was noticing and noticing as a staffer for, for John Lewis during that election campaign, just in his district, uh, that the, the dominant uh, feeling in the air, if not outright questions from potential voters were more or less like, what, like, what has John Lewis done? What have you done? What have you done oh, for wow. me lately? Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, it's interesting because, you know, like the 2010s itself, as well as the work on March, has really helped. I, I, we did what we set out to do, which was to revitalize this history and recontextualize it, but also to emphasize 
not only these direct contributions, but the fact that these are like the work, the dedication and the sacrifice of these young people at the time. The fact that these were young adults and teenage kids pushing this kind of change. Um, and so that also means that looking back 15 years ago at the dawn or just before the dawn of, of this project, uh, before those seeds were planted, um, during the civil rights movement, these like rapscallion teenagers <laughs> and young adults in SNCC, uh, you know, gained a level of mainstream acceptance as the momentum of the movement itself gained critical mass. Mm -hmm. But these are still like, you know, the, the, a lot of these activists in SNCC and CORE were maligned and perceived as like hot-headed radicals. And, uh, you know, like, I, I guess to extend that one step further, like, you know, in 1967 and 68, like by the time of Dr. King's death, Dr. King was was consistently polled as one of the most hated men in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and so th that informed a lot of our early work on the March trilogy was recognizing that, um, yeah, like from that bigger sense that like, as Andrew always says, like the Dr. King we celebrate today is not the Dr. King who was a living, breathing human. Uh, John Lewis was very serious about not only decentralizing the narrative while recognizing the contradiction that this is also a memoir, um, but also in uh, kind of knocking down the hero narrative that would have been that would have accompanied that. Um, and so uh, a lot of that involved just simply trying to emphasize the youth of a lot of the SNCC activists and student sit-in activists as much as possible, uh, trying to find, and a lot of this I, I, I think was my own curiosity at the drawing table, trying to find the moments which would illustrate that brashness, just seeking out joy and fun uh, from time to time, not recognizing the stakes of danger in a particular situation and then encountering it full on. Uh, that was a lot of the stuff that helped, uh, you know, knock down that hero narrative that that almost immediately began to smooth over an accurate history of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. um, post Voting Rights Act. So that that's interesting you say that not, you know, knocking down that hero narrative because I think about I, I teach March every chance I can get to teach it and students love it and one of the things they take away from it is is, is, is as almost a how-to guide for nonviolent protest so was there was there a sense of trying to balance that knocking down the hero narrative but also presenting this kind of lesson for readers on how to do this when it comes you know when, when it comes time to do it definitely uh i, I think the the most concise way to to word my answer mm -hmm is uh, John Lewis would, he would always try to describe March as a roadmap to change. Um, but accompanying that, that sense of it being a roadmap uh, as opposed to like an instructional was, yes, it is instructional. It is, you know, it does enlighten us with the methods, the tactics and the philosophies. But um, he, he was pretty serious and I was pretty serious about emphasizing that what succeeded in the civil rights movement, um, you know, like the, the tactics and strategies involved uh, don't work, you know, not only do they not work every time, often they don't work twice. Mm. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with being wily, with being <laughs> creative and with thinking from like a long, you know, having like playing the long game, but also thinking, you know, in a chaotic good mindset <laughs> where you're, 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 you have squirrely plans and some of them are, are going to pay off. Um, so a lot of it was like thinking about illustrating specifics and showing that roadmap, but uh, in the bigger, more general sense, recognizing that like this is a template, this is a roadmap, but the strategies and tactics that are going to affect change in the 2010s, the 2020s, the 2030s are not going to look like this necessarily. They'll be inspired and informed, uh, but it would be a fatal mistake for all of us to think that we can just replicate the methods of the movement and achieve the same results. Great. So um, I want to come back, come back to, to Grace. And when we, one of the things I probably should have said at the beginning is talked a bit about what 
from flung out of space is about. That it, it uh, whereas you know, Bix is a kind of encompasses uh, Bix Biederbeck's life life story, and and March starts with you know John Lewis's childhood, and now we're getting his his uh, political career in in Run. Um, Flung out of space is about a specific moment in in Patricia Highsmith's uh, career where she's seems she's transitioning from being a comic book writer to her first success with Strangers on a Train, which then goes into the price uh, the creation of the Price of Salt, um, and you you foreground very early in, in that introduction also that you are kind of fictionalizing this mm -hmm. the, this story right so. Uh, and and I don't want to, to spoil anything, because there, but there's some you know great guest stars in this, including Stanley. Now, was that was that <laughs> was that that and that that you set up as kind of the the kind of triggering moment for her to mm -hmm. to, to, to try a different career path. So, what did that? First of all, did that happen? Yes, she, okay, that is true. Yes, Patricia Highsmith was set up on a blind date with Stanley. That is true. <laughs> that <happened>. Yes. <laughs> And you know what I want? I, I'd like to see the like the alternative history story yeah, right. of what, what happened uh, 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 there. Um, so, um, but and 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 this is also a, a collaborative work as well. And so I've got got some pages now. Coincidentally, I prepared this ahead, but when you talked the other day, I know I used the same, you the same used some of the same images <laughs> and, and talked about some of these. But um, I'm I'm wondering like what. So this this is meant to what show the, the these are scenes from Strangers on a Train right on the yes. left and then and then her comic book writing on the right. So what um, what what does your what did your script do to indicate any you know anything like this and or how did you collaborate on you know some of these visual representations that you have here? Yeah, so. This is a book about writing, which is the most boring thing in the entire universe to depict because it's literally just like a person sitting there and the entire all of the actions happening inside their head. Um, but it, it was really we knew it was going to be fundamental to understanding who Patricia Highsmith was to like get inside of her head in those moments specifically. Um, so thinking about like what would be a way to represent a person's thoughts? Oh my God, thought bubbles, genius. Uh, <laughs> but like literal thought bubbles seemed a, a bit um, like literal, you know, like like the traditional words. So Han and I kind of cooked up this system to have um, like pictorial thought bubbles. Um, and we felt like having like dark murderous thought bubbles, like to visually represent the dark and murderous thoughts would be a nice offset to the, the comic stuff. And those are like Hannah's studies of uh, Pat's real comics, um, which are fascinating and just like God awful. Um, I don't recommend seeking them out because they're just like, uh, they just like suck. Um, <laughs> she's, uh, you read them and you're just like, oh, you're just like capable of so much more. I wish you like gave a shit about this, you know? Um, but anyway, so it was it was about like taking thought bubbles, which are really out of style now, but were really popular in the time when she was writing, using like the stuff of the time period to represent the time period, and then using the visual language to differentiate the two. Like very, she thought of them as two very different ideas. I think that if she were sitting in front of me, I would probably argue with her a little bit about that because a lot of a lot of the themes that show up in her books. Um, you you told me before we started that you teach talent to Mr. Ripley. Yeah, that would make a great comic book. It's very heightened. It's very like double identities. All yeah. of these things are in her comics, and all of these things are in her her prose books. I think they're all just kind of floating around in her head all the time, you know. But she she thought of them as very separate ideas. There's that one moment at the at the beginning of the talent of Mr. Ripley where Tom Ripley is like he, he's running these various scams that aren't kind of like produce any like they're, they're he, he's getting these these checks from people that he's never gonna ever gonna be able to cash and one of the people that he's scamming is a comic book writer yeah and he That's talks about how easy, <laughs> easy it is to scam comic book writers yeah <laughs> um that's that's a nice little like easter egg in that book but um so um yeah, so this this is this is in you know I when we think about you know movies that are about writers too they always have that 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 kind of challenge of how do you how do you demonstrate writing being a, a dramatic in a you know dramatic film and right. you've got 
you know, slamming a, right. <laughs> a piece of paper into the garbage can or something like that. Um, actually, let me go to this one. This, so since I mentioned this earlier, this this is the the date with Stan Lee, yeah. where now they're they're. Oh, before we get to that, which company did she write comics for? Um, she wrote for a whole bunch. Okay. Most of her work was for this company called Sanger Pines, which just kind of like petered out. Yeah. Um, but then she did a bunch of work for Timely. Um, when she was old, first of all, it's really hard to know exactly right. what she was writing because she, this is crazy. And it was so heightened that we didn't even put it in here because it seemed too crazy. She burned all the evidence that she ever wrote for comics, literally like wow. had a bonfire and burned oh, it. Wow. So we just don't have a complete list. Uh -huh. um, but when people would ask her about it, she would say things like Superman or Batman. And it's like, you did not write Superman or Batman, <laughs> but maybe she did. We just don't know, you know? Uh -huh. um, so I, yeah. Who knows? Is you no have, one living. <laughs> you, have, you have Richard Hughes as her editor, right? Yes. And, yeah. And he, I think he was associated later on with American Comics Group, I think. Is that, does Sanger Pines become that? I'm not sure. Your guess would, <laughs> okay. it sounds like your guess is probably better than <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, I know Richard Hughes because he created um, um, Herbie the Fat Fury, so. Uh, one of the great, <laughs> one of the greatest comics of all time. Um, so, uh, but so, so get kind of getting back to your collaboration. Then, how does you know this? This seems very similar the, to have this conversation. Yeah, have the, a similar thing. Are they are we seeing kind of the two of them talking? Are, are they kind of at cross purposes that she's she's talking about something like serious and he's he's talking about the value of superheroes here. Yeah, yeah. So I have just realized I did not answer your question before. No, How is it represented in the script? Oh boy. Uh, so it's basically, so I think of a script as like the starting point of a conversation with an artist. Um, so sometimes, like for example, for something like this, I would, I just put, um, talking about the thought bubbles or speech bubbles, I guess in this case, um, she's talking about something like dark and murderous and he's talking about comics and like represented in like the way that we talked about basically. Um, and then Hannah and I, if she felt like she needed more information about what to represent, um, we would talk about it. But I, actually, I think for this one, I literally said she's talking about strangers on a train. Mm -hmm. So, um, Hannah just had like a whole, like several pages that she did of studies of Strangers on a Train, the book. And I know that when she was working on this book, she was just kind of listening to Price of Salt and Strangers on a Train, just kind of like in a continuous oh, wow. loop. <laughs> um, so she had lots of, lots of thoughts on both of those books by the time it was over. <laughs> yeah, and, and here's another, another page where um, Pat is, is on a date with, um, a guy she ends up dating fairly regularly, right? Yeah. Mark Brandel, who actually, I feel, I actually, I feel kind of bad about this because this is a fictionalization. Um, I didn't get too deep into this, but Mark Brandel was actually another writer and he was more famous than she was. Hmm. Um, they met at a retreat and he's actually the one who came up with the name Strangers on a Train. And in the book, he just kind of gets turned into like a putz basically. <laughs> um, because well, because it's only two hundred pages, you right. know, and we're telling like we we got we got places to be here, but <laughs> but he 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 knew she was a lesbian and he proposed to her four times. It's just like oh, you kind of yeah. are a putz. You kind of deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I and mean, this this is just I mean, there's so many great great pages, and, and Hannah did such a great job on this this too, and the this scene where I mean, this is like a textbook for teaching page composition almost mm -hmm. that yeah. the way they're they're getting further and further apart yeah most, and is a genius you know. it's like honestly disgusting <laughs> she's just like an out and out genius uh, no. and was was she on board with this when you first proposed it as a collaboration or was she did, did she become part of the, <laughs> the team later this is so terrible oh no um, no, 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 no 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 so <laughs> hannah has an agent i love this dude Charlie. So I said, dear Charlie, can Hannah please work with me on this book? And Charlie said, no. And I said, okay. And I said, dear Hannah, do you want to work with me on this book? Don't do that. Don't do that. But, but the, the holdup was that she wanted to work on something really personal. And in her agent's mind, this was not that book, but it became so personal by the end that mm -hmm. Hannah got a, a tattoo for this book. Oh, wow. It's a snail. It's cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, going back back to Scott and talking about having it be personal, and you mentioned that at, at the beginning, and that's something that comes up in the introduction too about how um, this this became a really personal project. Now, was it did it, at what point at what stage in the process did you start to realize that this was becoming personal? Was it very early on in picking Bix, or was it as the story as the work progressed? Yeah, I, I think I chose Bix because he. Uh, you know, something about his story resonated with me. Mm. Um, you know, once I had the kind of formal idea of the book in place, it almost could have book been a book about any musician. Mm. So, um, but 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 I picked one that I felt you know whose story spoke to me, and and Bix was this uh, you know white kid from uh, uh, Davenport, Iowa, from this conservative religious German family who got it into his head he wanted to be a, a jazz musician and uh, you know ended up becoming a, a, a very very good one and and you know one of the first white musicians to really contribute to the evolution of jazz um, so you know he he, he was an, in, an insider in every way except the way he wanted to be you know and uh, like I find that really interesting um, you know like I said earlier I think most artists you, you know, Maybe they come from an unlikely place. You know, they, they, they have something that they have to get over. There's something in the way um, for them to get to that place over the hill that they want to get to. And, you know, maybe maybe your thing is race. Maybe it's your income level. Maybe it's geography. Maybe it's, you know, uh, you, you know, abuse. Maybe it's any number of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I just I just liked the kind of weird insider outsider quality uh, that he had, uh, y you know, hopefully in a much less self-destructive way. I'm a guy who came from an unlikely place who had this very unlikely thing he wanted to do. <laughs> and, you know, I've ended up doing it, hopefully at a, at a very high level. And uh, and I'm not going to drink myself to death. <laughs> um but yeah, there, there's there's something in that that I think that artists can relate to, that most people can probably relate to, and uh, yeah, I just I just thought this was the guy, you know, to wrap this experiment around. And it does it does seem you know, you're um, talking about Vix drinking himself to death, and he was what 28, yeah, and, and yeah. that seems to be a, you know, like a tragic period for a lot of great. <clears throat> big musicians, uh, uh, celebrities and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's He just missed the 27 Club with, yeah. the, with the Jim Morrison and the Janis Joplin and the Kurt Cobain. And and there was an early version of the story where I was actually going to kind of reference that. You know, some uh -huh. some of his, uh, you know, drunken hallucinations uh, were, were going to uh, include, you know, maybe some of those characters. Uh -huh. I, I pulled back on that a bit. I thought that was maybe putting a little bit too much of my junk into into his story but uh uh yeah the, the idea that he was kind of the original messed up i mean we've seen this story played out so many times with so many musicians since of kind of destroying themselves at a young age and uh yeah he he was kind of ground zero for all of that so so nate um on the kind of similar level you're since you're working with somebody else's script and telling and the you know, uh, you know, doing what you, you described it as a memoir, um, was was there a point in which it became personal to you as well while you're you're doing this? Uh, yeah, it it was immediately personal to me. Uh, one one reason why I was recommended by Chris Staros from Top Shelf to try out for the role of artist, um, like you know, there were like formal and creative uh, reasons, and I turn in my work on time <laughs> part of it. but one reason was because um well because i'm a southerner but because i lived a lot of my childhood in montgomery alabama my family's from mississippi uh going back a long time and so in terms of balancing the historical the, balancing the objective and subjective uh components of the work like a lot of the not only visuals but a lot of the non-verbal information in the book uh, was something that I at least had a reasonable level of familiarity with already, uh, not just culturally, but like topographically. 
what roads and sidewalks are made of, what kind of grass and trees and dirt, um, what specific buildings and areas of, of you know, towns in Alabama were made of. Uh, and these were things that I was already ready to take from my own memories and inject into the visuals of the work. Like there's a ditch that I used to play in, featured in my book, Any Empire. Um, <laughs> there, there's a ditch when I was a kid in Montgomery that I used to play in. And the ditch ended at the end of the old Troy Highway. And at the other end of the old Troy Highway was John Lewis's boyhood home, oh, wow. which obviously I did not know at the time. But, it, you know, as soon as I dove in and started off by reading Walking with the Wind, I immediately identified with him as a six year old, uh, like the, the gravity and intensity he viewed the world through. But then I recognized that, like, I knew these locations already. Um, and then I, I recognized, so like there's that part. And I, I realized I had opportunities at every turn to actually make a lot of the visuals feel personal because whenever possible, they actually were personal, um, especially in book two, which is hyper-focused in Alabama mm -hmm. uh, and going into book three. Um, and the other part is the this intergenerational reckoning with the failure to teach the history of the movement. So like, I am one of millions mm -hmm. of, you know, Generation X and older millennial white Southern kids who would have been taught enough about civil rights movement history from our well-meaning mm -hmm. white baby boomer Southerner parents. Mm -hmm. But um, you basically, like as an eight-year-old, you know, like learning a lot of this stuff in Montgomery, a lot of my parents' anecdotes and history were always punctuated by this thing that I didn't understand at the time that was always trying to present a divide between the historical information they were teaching and the world we were in now, which often was like only 15 to 20 years separate. Um, mm -hmm. And it was confusing, uh, especially when like, you know, a lot of the, I would look at photos and video at the time of a lot of this stuff happening from the movement. And I had visited a lot of this stuff with my family uh, or with my class. And it was like, it was literally five miles down the road from my house. <laughs> and so I was like, why do people keep saying how different mm -hmm. of a world the history was from what I, what I've been to and what I've already mm -hmm. seen. Once I recognized that, you know, like an entire generation of well-meaning uh, white Southern baby boomers had all this baggage. They still refused to unpack. And that that was at the, the center of this failure of historical education, I was like, well, I'm going to destroy this problem <laughs> and it's personal. Like, yeah. so when I say it's personal, I really mean I recognized how incorrect so many of my assumptions were about the movement. And I carried that until 2011 when I mm -hmm. started working on March. And, you know, like I read a lot. I thought I was like very politically informed mm -hmm. and historically informed. And it was a shock mm -hmm. to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like I'm throwing everything I knew into the garbage can and just starting from scratch. Yeah. That, that, that just reminds me of moments I have when I teach, when I teach March and the students do have that kind of, well, this, this is way in the past, you know, and we're so much better, better now. And I, and I'm te I teach in South Carolina and the, and, you know, I, I asked them if any, anybody knows, for example, when, uh, the mis miscegenation laws in South Carolina were taken off the books and it was within my student's lifetime and it, it only passed like 60 to 40, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. the, and, and that's in the, in the 21st century. Um, and so they, you know, they're, uh, just, you know, bring, bring up something like that and what, uh, uh, and let alone everything else that's going on. That they 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 become shocked that these things are still you know they're that that this you know uh, the, uh, about the the kind of legal side of all this. Well, it's all it's always very purposeful uh, error, I think, to to stress that the past is always a distant past yeah. without going to the, the William Faulkner quote, just, <laughs> just stressing that it serves a purpose to be like, yeah, past is another world. Do, do you see save it for later as like a an, an out a natural kind of progression from your work on March? I didn't initially. Uh -huh. um, uh, I, I basically went in a nutshell. 
I, I, when I started work on what would turn into save it for later, I was doing it for me because I felt like I was losing a lot of the details of some of the, some of the minutia of my family's experiences and our feelings and our reactions in that first year of an authoritarian power grab. But also I felt like the space had been pushed aside already for people to be like, yeah, we, I, I want to talk about the way, I, the way I feel and what my private experience has been trying to uh, experience, trying to get through all this. Eventually that turned into the, the memoir component of the book. But along the way, I uh, recognized, well, yeah, a lot of this was happening in real time. So as mm -hmm. my small kids were growing, I was then beginning to experience March as a reader and as a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like curating my four, five, six year olds experience of the history by reading March with them. And it was getting more complex each time we would read. Um, and so with each experience, with each read through, and as the world was shifting, as our society was shifting rapidly, um, then it, I, I recognized that there was a direct link, uh, but it was not originally the intention of the book whatsoever. It was therapy at first. Wow, great. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, or, or we could go on forever. It's, we don't have anything after this, but I want to open up the floor to questions so we can have some time with our uh, guests. Yeah, go ahead, and I'll, I'll make sure I repeat the question. Question for Grace. So I was noticing going over when we had the panel layout with the flat family. Yeah. So the collaboration with your audience, was that like Marvel method or more script oriented? Because I noticed like there's a rhythm here, right? Yeah. Um, so to, to repeat the question with with the no, that's okay. The with the um the uh scene scene with with Stanley uh was the script uh using the Marvel method or was it more of a, a straightforward script? It was I guess I was gonna say it was just straightforward script, but I guess it was a little bit of both for the for this scene specifically. Um so what I I like to leave a lot of like holes, like quote unquote holes for artists. You you have to let people make their own creative decisions within like the parameters that the story requires, basically. Um, so I set aside this splash page and I like wrote at the top of the page, this is a splash page. And I said, this is going to be the date with Stanley. Uh, they're just around, they're going around the apartment as you move across the page, they're becoming more comfortable with each other. And then at the end, they're talking about the projects they're working on. Um, everything else was Hannah. Um, it's kind of cut off, but there's also, yeah. there's a third person in this yeah, too, yeah. who's just like not a part of it at all. And I really <laughs> like that. Um, but yeah, I think I working on any book like, like this one, it, it requires a lot of creative trust um, because there are so many there are so many moments in this book that are just like pure, like acting moments. We talked a lot about like blocking and choreography and like how we wanted like the scene to feel. And those are the kinds of questions that are answered in the script, but are also answered in an ongoing way. Um, even after I, one kind of like a golden rule is once the, once the art is done, like the art is done and we're like not gonna go back and change it because that, sucks and it's a lot of work uh, but even even in this book because there were so many ongoing conversations about how we wanted it to feel um there were a couple pages where hannah had to go back and change some of the acting because we didn't like how it felt um we didn't like how and there were a couple moments where pat was like too sympathetic and it's like okay. I, I don't i don't i think that we need to, to hate her a little bit um, <laughs> but i to i guess i guess the answer is both um so it's a, a script, I, in my my talk on Thursday, I, I wanted to put some, I was going back to the scripts to, to put some of the examples and excerpts up on the board, but some of them are just like, they're just like total nonsense because they're just, they're just literally a starting point for what will be like a continuing conversation, you know? Great. I hope that was helpful and not just like a bunch <laughs> of random crap I threw yeah, at you. Go ahead. <laughs> my question is for all three panelists. Whenever you make a comic book, there's a lot of research involved. So mm -hmm. with a historical comic, how much of that research do you show to the reader versus how much do you hide? 
Okay, so yeah, the question is, that's a good concise question. How much of the research do you show to the reader and how much do you hide? And I really appreciate that question because I had a whole bunch of questions about research that I didn't get to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can answer that one pretty quickly. Uh, I, Andrew and I feel that this is one of the mistakes we made in March uh, was that we, I mean, thankfully we were working together with a, a primary source yeah, yeah. and we were telling this history through his eyes and his words. However, I mean, I can't tell you how much research went in, not only from Andrew's end, from my end, from Lee's end, our editor, but um, I mean, it, wor it works very well as a series of books, but if we were to go back and do it again, without any hesitation, every book would have to have like run. We fixed the problem. We added 50 pages at the end or 40 pages. That's just footnotes, citations, reference, character profiles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, uh, that remains one of our long-term goals when we revisit March. Um, but I guess plainly, we didn't show our research and reference within the pages of the book. And perhaps we implicitly fell back on the fact that our primary source was making the book with us. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey with me. Like the first historical biographical thing I did was this, Two Generals, which is a much better known book in Canada than it is here. But this is the book that kind of, you know, it's my it's my march. It's my, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's my big book. Um, uh, at least uh, north of the border. And um, it's about my grandfather's experiences in, in the Second World War. And I went into it thinking, like, I really want this to be his book. I want to keep my stuff out of it. I want to be as historically accurate as I can. You know, facts, facts, facts. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I hit my head on the ceiling of what you can do with that pretty quickly. Because... Um, you know, what I found is even with your, like I was dealing with my grandfather's diary and his best friend's letters and the regimental war diary and, um, you know, other, other veterans who were friends with both men <clears throat> who I interviewed. And uh, what I found pretty quickly is that people can't agree on shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so you do as much research as you can and you get as many perspectives as you can. But at some point, unless you've got John Lewis standing next to you saying, you know, like, Hey John, what happened? Uh, you have to make a judgment call. And, um, as soon as you make a judgment call, you are imposing your point of view on the thing. And, um, so, you know, when it came time to do Bix, I, I knew that I'd had the experience. So I, I knew that you have to go through a stage where you've got your historian hat on and that when once you've done that, you've got to put your writer hat on and um, say, OK, there's a story in here. Let me find it. <laughs> right. And, you know, not that you're inventing stuff out of whole cloth, but I felt a lot more comfortable making those. OK, this source is right. This source is wrong. Or, you know, or at least I'm going to find some kind of middle ground between them that will make either everyone or no one happy. Um, but yeah, you, you have to get in there with both hands and decide, uh, you know, what is true because, uh, yeah, no one else, <laughs> no one else is going to do that for you. Like I said, unless you've got John Lewis and you're kind of telling a story from his point of view. Um, yeah, I, I found it, uh, yeah, that to me, that's the challenge of, of historical work is, um, uh, you know, finding the confidence to make those calls. Grace, do you have anything on, on that too? Yeah, on your I do, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 please, go. I'm not um, saying that the like. No, 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 off. so obviously we did, we did tons of research for this. Um, we knew from the beginning, I knew, this was my idea. Um, I wanted to do kind of like a, like a biopic basically. Um, so it was never gonna be strictly true. Um, the first phase was reading all the really thick biographies um, and getting a sense of what the story actually was. Um, whittling it down consisted mostly of just telling people the story verbally, um, because when you do that, you kind of make edits naturally based on what people are responding to, uh, which is how Stan Lee became such a major part of it, because you say Stan Lee and everyone's like, that's crazy. And you're like, it is crazy. You're right. That should be in here. Um, 
so that that was kind of how like we whittled it down. And then we contacted um, Pat's official biographer, Joan Shankar, to write the afterword for the book. If you've read the book, you might have noticed that that's not in there. It's because she died in the middle of writing oh, it. No. Um, and it just didn't feel it didn't feel right to contact a different biographer because it was just it was it was really sad. Mm-hmm. It was like a very, very upsetting day. Um, and we, I don't know, I think we're, we're kind of, it's so interesting that you're talking about like appendix, appendixes in the back, because I don't, I don't think this is like, um, really giving anything away, but we're working on the, um, the paperback edition of this. And in the back of that, we're having a bunch of educational materials. Um, and a lot of the research is in, is in that at least. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't think that anyone expects this to be like the definitive book. Cause I don't, I don't know that this is like necessarily the right medium for like mm. a fully true everything is absolutely accurate story at least that wasn't our goal here and you do point the readers to those right those the, bi- the, the big the, big biographies big, right yeah. there's yeah. also the level of visual research right because yeah. once once yeah. you've done all your kind of story research on your on your historical the person and whatnot you've decided what happens then you sit down to draw page one and you're like, damn it! I need to know what. Yeah, what's the furniture like? Yeah, I like what know. does that <laughs> lamp look like right. in 1921? Um, and and yeah, I felt like with with two generals and stuff, it was military stuff, which you know is kind of in my family, but I don't know anything about. And so you know, I, I had to you know figure out which cap goes with which uniform and which badge goes on which cap, and and uh, of course they get into combat and it all goes out the window anyway. But um, it's. Uh, yeah, there's there's the whole other level with historical material of, uh, you know, what what do things look like, and, and, and so you got to get into that too. Um, other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, this is for uh, all of you, but aside from getting facts into the story, what differences do you find between writing pure fiction and creative? Okay, great question. The differences between writing pure fiction and creative nonfiction. Uh, good. Another series of questions that I didn't get to. <laughs> um, let me start with maybe uh, with with Nate because I was thinking about that in relationship to something like Two Dead, which is probably what Scott's describing a lot of historical research in terms of what you visualize in, in that book. Um, I I think that uh, because I. I'm admittedly a weaker writer than an artist. Uh, like I, I like my stories that I write a lot. They're very special to me. But like I know that I've been building up my writing chops over these past 30 years. And they started from a very low level. Um, I feel like um, it's been a matter of being able to take a lot of the concreteness and clarity that I had to... I had to internalize it in order to make March happen and make it work. Uh, and once I developed that skill skill set and it became a natural part of my storytelling, and, and once I didn't have baggage about it, like every once in a while, in 2008 at, at SPX, I think Gilbert Hernandez was doing this little panel and a life-changing moment for me was when he was talking, it showed like whoever was moderating had this panel that was like one of one of Gilbert's characters, like just the, it was like a golden age throwaway comic book panel, except it was for real. It was this enormous word bubble with captioning and there was only enough room for a character's head. But that panel had to contain the space that had the information to move the comic along. And basically it's him being like, not every panel is going to be your best panel. Sometimes <laughs> this panel happens. And I was like, sometimes this panel does happen. <laughs> so like, it, it let me let go of a lot of baggage where, you know, sometimes when we had to be like, okay, you guys, how are we going to fit all of this text into this half page so we can move on? Uh, once I ironed a lot of that stuff out, I, I, I feel like the concreteness and the clarity coming first let me go back to my weirdo, magical, realist fiction stories where it's usually like it's a more of an intuitive thing that I'm trying to convey and I'm trying to build a story. I'm like reverse engineering a plot and story to convey this feeling that I want to convey or convey questions I want to ask or whatever. <laughs> but but post-March, when I went back to come again, uh, I feel like 
it was no longer this like nail biting thing where all of a sudden I felt the desire to bring forth more concreteness and clarity to establish a scene that a reader could live in uh, so that then I kind of had more room to get weird and intuitive with it. Um, and yeah, I felt like with Two Dead, I worked with Van Jensen who wrote it, but thankfully, you know, there was so much breathing room for me to get weird already that I felt like I was well adapted by that point to be like, here's where the, the narrative information goes. And here's where all the period information goes that I need to apply to the story. And, the, and I know that this space is for me to get weird. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For, for me, um, and, and I do a lot of both. I mean, my, my career is very weird and it has two sides. I, I have, I do kind of like adult historical biographical stuff and I do kids fantasy. <laughs> and some people aren't even aware I'm the same guy. Like I'll get a dad and a daughter at, at, at the table and they'll kind of figure it out while they're standing there. Oh, yeah, we both like this guy. Um, but um, I, like, I find it quite different when I'm doing either one, not just in terms of content, but in terms of my approach. Like with fiction, I mean, you're sitting down with a blank page or a blank screen and you're trying to fill that space and you're done when you're satisfied. With nonfiction, you're never quite sure when you're done because you might be two years into your research and someone opens a closet and finds a shoebox full of letters and now you've got to read all that and incorporate all of it. So I really think of it as like fiction is additive. Mm -hmm. You're like I say, you got a blank page and you're adding stuff, you know, in, until you've got a story. I think of nonfiction as uh, subtractive. Mm -hmm. So you're starting with a bunch of research. And like I said, you may not even know you're done yet. Um, and you're trying to find the story in that research. You know, at some point you've got to decide, okay, the story I'm telling is about, I don't know if it's two generals, it's friendship and death. I'm going to take all the bits of information out of this research that speak to friendship and death. And those will, you know, become the scenes in, in the book. So you're, you're taking everything else away. It's like a big strainer. <laughs> you're, you're straining all your research out except for the bits that don't speak to the themes that you've decided you you want to speak to. It's kind of like what Nate just said, but just I added a soup strainer. <laughs> so, so, so Grace, with your with your fictional work, you have the addition of that that being aimed at an audience that's not going to be the audience that reads flung out of space, right? Yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe. I yeah. I mean, they could grow. The, those kids that were reading Lumberjanes yeah, we'll early on will, will, yeah, will grow up and, and, and follow through. But did, does that, does that audience issue play any, any difference in that, in this kind of question? Mm, I feel like I approach writing for kids in the same way that I approach, I approach this one. Just in. <laughs> oh, damn. We figured out what would happen. <laughs> well, I didn't have anything interesting to say anyway. So oh. okay. <laughs> well, then I guess we yeah we're forced out. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, thanks, thanks for your guests. And hope hope to see you again tomorrow. <laughs>